Hello and welcome to another Revelation study. We are on chapter 10 today. We're going to call this chapter by a question, is there any hope? Let me begin by reading this whole chapter. It's only 11 verses. We'll look at them all today. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a raiment rainbow was on his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth and when he had cried seven thunders uttered their voices and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices I was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me seal up those things which are which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little <coughs> excuse me, the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And when I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book, and he said unto me, Take it and eat it up and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And may the Lord add his blessing to his word. The book of Revelation, as we've said many times here, is the glorious advanced history of how Jesus Christ becomes king. He takes the throne by means of judgment. And here in this passage we have another interlude. This time it is between the sixth and the seventh trumpets. I like to begin with a story. It, in 1955, Billy Graham was in England and he was holding a crusade. He was preaching at Wembley Stadium. He had been there for some period of time. And while he was there, he got an invitation to go see the Prime Minister of England. This was the final year Winston Churchill served as Prime Minister there. Chomping on an unlit cigar, Winston Churchill looked Billy Graham up and down with a penetrating eye, and then he said to him, Young man, <coughs> I've heard a great deal about the Crusades you are having here. I want to ask you a question. You know the troubled shape the world is in. Personally, I don't think the world has much longer to go. Can you give an old man any hope? It seemed to Billy Graham that Churchill was not just seeking hope for the troubled world, but he was seeking hope for a troubled old man as well. Billy Graham took out his Bible and he showed him the only hope for this world is the ultimate triumph in Jesus Christ. And the only hope for the individual is the hope and faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. I don't think anyone knows if Winston Churchill ever committed his life to Jesus Christ, but the question he asked Billy Graham when he was in his mid-thirties at this time is the same question people are struggling with today. Evil is on the rise. The world is becoming a more precarious place all the time. People are asking with the shape that the world is in today is if there is any hope. To me, the question we confront in Revelation 10 is this question. I, I think this is more relevant than, than ever before. John, in the previous two chapters, has seen the outpouring of these trumpet judgments, these terrible trumpet judgments. Man must have been wondering, is there any hope? So in Revelation chapter 10, it comes just in time. This chapter is an interlude of hope. It's a, it's a break or pause in the action. It's a pause to tell us that no matter what is happening, God is in control. And I think this chapter teaches us one very important message that is relevant for today. 
And the lesson is this, focusing on God's sovereignty and feeding on God's scripture is the source of our hope. Focusing on the sovereignty of God and feeding on the scriptures of God is the only source of hope that we have. To develop that, I have three points uh, that I want to make. And this chapter opens with a description of this messenger. We see in verses 1 through 4 that there are three key interpretive issues. And the first one is, who is this mighty strong angel in verse 1? Where it says, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Many people believe that this angel is Jesus. Because uh, uh, the... Let me, let me back up here and say uh, that angels are mentioned in every chapter of Revelation up to this point. And chapter 10 is no exception. Exception. I just think that's kind of a cool tidbit to, to throw in there. But many people think this is Jesus because of the way deity is often described. But I think a better view is that this is just another angel in a series of angels that we have seen in this book. And let me give you the reasons why I believe that. Uh, first of all, is because of the word another there in verse 2. In the Greek, it is alos, which means another of the same kind. The word heteros means another of a different kind. But this here is another of the same kind. So this is the same kind of angel that we have been seeing uh, throughout the book. Also, when Jesus appears in the book of Revelation, there is never any doubt that it is him. Uh, this is an unveiling of Jesus. And also, Jesus is not called an angel anywhere else in the book of Revelation. Another thing is, is if this were Jesus, John would worship him. But John never falls down uh, to worship this angel. And then also down in verse 6, it says this angel swore by him that lives forever and ever. He wouldn't swear by himself. And it seems odd that God would, would swear like this and refer to himself in the third person. So I take that take it that this angel is not Jesus, but it is his representative. Why would this angel be described in a way that is similar to Jesus? But the reason I think that that is the case is because again, he is representing Jesus. He is Jesus's representative. He's close to Christ. You know like Mo Moses when he uh, went down, went up on the mountain into the presence of God, his, his face shone with the glory of God. The second major question is, what is this small book? A lot of people take this book to be the same book back in Revelation chapter 5. Remember there, the scroll uh, that was being opened. The problem with this is that there's two different Greek words being used here. This is called a small or a little scroll. My view is that it is the content of the rest of the book of Revelation. And at the end of this chapter, we see that John eats this little book. He takes it in and then he's told to speak out its contents. So it is Revelation chapters 11 through 22. So the angel here is holding the message of the rest of the book that ends in history. He's holding it in his hand. Notice how the location of this angel is stressed. In verses 2, 5, and 8, it says three times that he has his foot on the sea and the other foot on the land. It's emphasizing over and over again the sovereignty of God and how he controls the land and the sea. <clears throat> so this is really a preview of Christ coming to take over. And what we're going to read in the rest of the book is Christ's victory coming to fruition. This angel is claiming the earth for his king. Kind of like an ancient explorer when they would go somewhere and they would represent the king. They would place their flag upon that land and they would claim that territory for their king or their queen. Looking like when we planted the U.S. flag upon the moon, we were staking our claim here as uh, this belongs to us. And, and there, this angel is saying, this earth and the sea, it belongs to the king. There's a third issue here in verses 1 through 4, and I find it very interesting 
what are the seven thunders? This is the only sealed thing uh, that is still that was still sealed up in the book of Revelation. Everything else is open. So we can't be sure what it is because the Bible doesn't tell us specifically. But we do know that thunder in the Bible is associated with God's judgment. It seems to me that there are seven additional judgments that God is going to bring on the earth during this tribulation period. And one of the things that tells us is we don't know everything God is going to do in the tribulation period. And then now we come to the declaration of this messenger. The basis for God taking possession is that God made everything. God created it all. So it's his. It rightfully belongs to him. And the time has come. The time has ran out. There is no further delay. God is going to set up his kingdom first upon this earth, and then he's going to rule for all eternity. I mean, right now we live in that time of delay. But there will come a time uh, when this time of delay will come to an end. Sometimes we wonder why God is taking so long. But God is patient. He, he's long-suffering. And he views time differently than we do. It's like the man who asked God, God, what's a million years to you? God said, a million years is like a minute. Well, what is a million dollars to you, God? And God says, a million dollars to me is like a penny. And so he said, God, can I have a penny? And God says, wait a minute. So God not only controls things, that is what happens, but God also controls time, and that is when things happen. Someday God is going to put, set his foot down and announce it's over. And when that seventh angel sounds, the mystery of God is going to be finished. In verse 7, we see the word days. So that seventh trumpet judgment is going to have a series of things happen. It will take time, and it will include several different events. What is the mystery of God that is going to be finished? A mystery in the Bible is something that man only knows because of divine revelation. He is only able to understand because God has revealed it to him. A mystery certainly is why God allows evil to prosper. And I think it's the whole purpose of God in history that we need to take into account. And the kingdom of God is going to be brought to a climation and evil is going to be dealt with. The kingdom was unveiled to the Old Testament prophets, but it's gonna come eventually here to a place of fruition. And by the way, that is the only hope for mankind. God is going to wrap up the events of history and nothing is going to be able to delay it when God says the time has come. When God says time's up, the answer to Winston Churchill's question will be answered. This passage closes with the directions of this message. He has some directions for John stating, starting in verse 8. Uh, and it's where it begins and says, The voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Actually, what John is doing is reenacting what Ezekiel did. In Ezekiel chapters 2 and 3, he ate a book. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 says, When I looked, a hand was sent to me, and a scroll was in it, and he spread it before me. And there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were words of lamentation and mourning and woe. And then in chapter 3, Verses 1 through 4, it continues, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me this scroll. He said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your inward parts with the scroll that I give you. Then I ate it, and it was as honey for sweetness in my mouth. Then he said to me, Son of man, Go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. 
So God is feeding Ezekiel the message, and then Ezekiel is going to give it to the people. He's going to speak it out. And that's why I think this little book in Revelation 10 is the rest of the contents of the book of Revelation. John is going to take it in, and he's going to eat it, and then he's going to speak it out. He's going to assimilate it for himself, first of all, and then he's going to go out, and he's going to speak it. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your word became to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. So they are eating, and that process is taking in God's word. Psalm 119 has many references like this, but 103, verse 103 says, How sweet are your words to the taste of my mouth, sweeter than honey to my mouth. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, the word of God is pictured as milk. <clears throat> so throughout scripture, it's, it's spoken of as bread and milk and meat and honey. And John eating it refers appropriating it and assimilating it into his life. And that's what we need to do with God's word. We need to appropriate it. We need to assimilate it into our life um, so that it becomes a part of our lives. For, so that it becomes personal to us, where the Word of God actually becomes a part of you. The Emperor of Ethiopia, Menelik II, he reigned from 1889 to 1913, and he is credited with bringing Ethiopia into the 20th century. He introduced public education, telephone, telegraph service, all these various things. He was a very forward-thinking man in that day and in his culture. But he had one very superstitious practice. He believed that when <clears throat> he was ill, all he needed to do to feel better was to eat a few pages of the Bible. He practiced this form of self-medication for years. Usually, he did get better. Then, during the last few years of his life, he had a series of strokes that left him partially paralyzed. After one of these strokes in December of 1913, he was feeling very ill and very weak. He asked for his aides to tear out the entire book of 1 Kings and bring it to him. They fed it to him page by page, and he began to eat it. It was later reported that he died about the time he was consuming the story of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Now, of course, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about eating it spiritually, uh, taking it into your life that you and I might get the very heart of the Word of God and get that Word into ourselves. Charles Spurgeon said, As I have seen the silkworm eat unto the leaf and consume it, so ought we to do with the Word of the Lord, not crawl over its surface, but eat right into it till we have taken it into our innermost parts. It is idle merely to let the eye glance over the words or to recollect the poetical expressions or the historical facts. But it is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in scriptural language and your very style is fashioned upon scriptural models. And what better? what is better still, your spirit is flavored with the words of the Lord. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people said of you, of you this person is a living Bible? The tragedy today is that many believers are, are malnourished, and because of that they are gullible victims of what is false. They are casualties in spiritual warfare. God's word is our nourishment. Read the Bible, and when you do, ask some questions. You will find out that the Bible is both sweet and sour. John said it was sweet in his mouth, but sour in his stomach. God's word is the ultimate sweet and sour. And prophecy is sweet and sour. It is sweet because it tells us that Jesus Christ is coming back to rule and to reign. It's filled with great, precious, glorious promises for our future. But it's also sour because it tells us that the kingdom comes, but it must come by means of judgment. The gospel message itself is a sweet and sour message. It is sweet in that it is good news to those who hear it and respond to it. It promises us the sweetness of eternal life, 
the forgiveness of our sins, and the hope of heaven. But the same gospel is sour and bitter. It's bad news to those who reject it. <clears throat> there is an important lesson in here for us, and that is we must never dilute the Word of God. Far too many preachers today are adding artificial sweeteners to the Bible. They leave out the part where people are sinners in need of a Savior. They leave out the parts of hell. We want to say what the Bible says, and the message of the Bible is truly a bittersweet one. And we see the timing of Revelation 10. We are not waiting for this event, but the coming of Jesus to rapture his bride. And we need to be conscious of the times in which we live. A man rushed to a railway station one morning. He's all out of breath. And he asked, what time does the 801 leave? The guy said, at 801. He said, well, by my watch, it's 759. It's 757 by the town clock. It's 804 by the station clock. Which one should I go by? The agent said, you can go by any clock you want, but it's too late. The 801 has already left the station. The truth is, if you are not on God's train, you will be left. You will be left behind. And you don't want to miss God's train and go through this time of tribulation. Take Christ as your Savior. And verse 11 is a beautiful verse, and it really is one of the key verses in the book of Revelation. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. God has taken it, or John has taken in the word, and he is going to prophesy again. This time the focus is going to be different. And another lesson here for us is we have to assimilate God's word and metabolize it into ourselves before we can dissimilate it. We have, in other words, we have to take it in before we can give it out. And we have to train our children and our grandchildren in it. There's a story uh, from Germany back in the 12th century. A tradition developed among Jewish people. They would bring a child to the rabbinical school for the very first time on the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Trumpets. I'm not sure which one it was actually, but the rabbi would read every letter of the Hebrew alphabet and the child would repeat the letter after him. And then he would write all those words on a slate and then he would put honey on top of that. And the child would literally lick the honey from, of the Hebrew letters that were written on the slate. It was to teach them at a very young age that the sweetest thing in life to them was the Word of God. And the basis for this was that passage in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 3. We have to start teaching our children when they are young that the Word of God is sweet. It is the sweetest and most precious thing in all of the world. Think about this world that we are sending our children and our grandchildren out in. It is the sovereignty of God and the Word of God that we give them and teach them that is their hope. But they need to see that in our lives as well. We need to set the example. They need to see us reading the Bible, assimilating it into our life, and then giving it out. May God help us as we learn that God's word is both sweet and bitter, but we are faithful to proclaim and live out the whole message. God bless you. Have a great day.